You're listening to the James Faith in Jesus Work Series, preached by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. We're going to be in the book of James this morning. As we open our Bible, I want to begin by reminding us that the Bible is not primarily a book of beliefs. It is not enough to understand the concepts and to know the teachings. It is not enough to give mental assent to what the Word says. It's not enough just to know what's in here and to know what it says and to know the stories and to have all of that knowledge filling our head. Because the Bible is not just a book of beliefs. I know we know this already. right? You, we already understand that the Bible must transform us. It must impact us. It must change us. But although we know it in our head, sometimes I fear that we still, we still don't believe it. We still don't really know it, right? We would be the first ones to say, yes, the Bible is not just a book of beliefs. It needs to change your life. But when we look at our lives, we say, how has the Bible recently been changing us? When's the last time I opened up God's word in my personal devotion, my personal study, and I felt that God had told me something that required me to change myself? Sometimes we know things, but we don't really know them. And so the Bible is a book that is meant to transform us. And the reality of the practical nature of this book is evident nowhere in Scripture more than it is here in the book of James. James is an immensely practical book. In fact, a cursory reading of this book may lead us to believe that the Bible, the Christian life, is just a series of do's and don'ts. And that's that's not a good thing. But what I'm saying here is the Bible is so so practical here in the book of James that sometimes we read it and if we don't get the book of James in the context of the whole scripture, we might just assume that basically Christian living is being good. And that, that's not a good assumption. We need to read the book of James in light of all of scripture. Um, this year we will celebrate 500 years since the official beginning of the Protestant Reformation. The emphasis in the Protestant Reformation, as you well know, is on faith in Christ alone for salvation. Where do we find salvation? It is in Christ. It is through grace. It is by faith alone. Where do we find truth? It is in the word of God alone. And those are the things that that the Protestant Reformation was standing for. Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany. And for the Protestant Reformation, the book of Galatians was... it acted as as the guiding book, the cornerstone. Because the book of Galatians so clearly presents the gospel as our our only hope of salvation. That it's it's justification by faith alone. It's so clear, clear in the book of Galatians. By contrast, it's been said that Luther tore the book of James out of his Bible for a time. In fact, he wrote in his first introduction to the New Testament, he said, St. John's Gospel and his first epistle, St. Paul's epistles, especially those to the Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and St. Peter's epistle, these are the books which show to thee Christ. Therefore, St. James' epistle is a perfect straw epistle compared with them. Straw epistle is not really a nice thing to say about a book, especially a book in the Bible. Now, to be fair to Luther... That was only included in his first edition of his preface to the New Testament. That paragraph was removed in all future editions, meaning he didn't didn't continue to believe that James was was just a straw epistle. And later on in his life, he said it's a good book with a lot of good sayings. So that wasn't, but the reason Martin Luther was so for the book of Galatians and, and didn't necessarily love the book of James is because he saw Galatians was clearly but grace by faith alone, and he saw the book of James just not clearly um, exclaiming that. And and here's the the thing that we got to realize about Martin Luther. He was fighting a war. He was in a war against the religion of the day that said that faith plus works equals salvation. And so he was looking for a book that only exclaimed faith alone. Here in the book of James, we got to understand we are also in a war. And our war is, certainly it is that salvation is by faith alone. But in our own lives, we're also in a war that is for us to become more and more like Christ, more and more like our Savior. 
And so the book of James is of the utmost importance in this regard. It is the single greatest resource for practical Christian living. And I think what James does is it highlights the glory of God's word. That we need all of it together. We need books like Galatians that will tell us how to be saved. We need books like like the book of James that tells us how to live out our faith. How does the faith that saved us now transform us? James helps us with that. 59 times in the book of James, out of 108 verses, there are imperatives, commands for us to keep. In this book, we will learn about Christ-like behavior. Alistair Begg said, God's word was not given to us ultimately so that our knowledge would be increased, but that our lives would be changed. The emphasis in James is not on becoming Christian, but on behaving as Christians. In fact, in James chapter 1, verse 2, James writes, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now, there are a lot of different commands, and the command to, uh, against partiality is just one of them. But I think the very start of that verse highlights what James is doing. He says, um, Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ... And then he explains what it means to to not have that kind of faith. In other words, what he's telling us to do there, and I think throughout the book of James, is how do we have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ? How do we we own that? How do we possess that? Now that, Now that we've been saved by grace through faith, how does that faith change us? How do we possess that faith we now have? And so I'd like you to to look at James um, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. And we'll see how James begins this incredibly practical epistle. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. And believe it or not, this introduction is fascinating. It's fascinating for a few reasons. The first one is how James introduces himself. And the second one is, who, who is James writing to? He introduces himself as a servant or as a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's fairly normal for the the authors of the Bible to do, to present themselves as a servant or a bondservant or a slave. But what's interesting here is that this author is the natural-born half-brother of Jesus Christ. He shared the same mother as Jesus. So it's, it's interesting here that he doesn't just immediately pull rank. This is James, the brother of Jesus. Who else can say that? And there's there's three or four other people in the world that might be able to say that we share the same mother. That would be an incredible way of pulling rank, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he introduces himself as a slave. And as a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord there is the word that they used when they were moving the word Yahweh from Hebrew into Greek, kurios. And so here we have James not just saying he's my Lord in a sign of devotion. He's giving Jesus his brother this title of the supreme ruler, the supreme authority, the Lord, and then Jesus, and then Christ is another title. He's the Messiah, the sent one, the anointed one. He realizes that his relationship with Jesus, it, it's, it's not just natural-born brothers. The important part of his relationship with Jesus is that Christ is his Lord, that he's the Messiah that was sent to die for his sins. So that's how he sees this relationship. James makes no mention that he shared the same natural mother as Jesus. He says, I am a slave of God. I am a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think here is the great news for us when we recognize the story of James. James was once an unbeliever. In John chapter 7, verse 5, we find that it says, For neither did his brethren, his brothers, believe in him. Jesus, I mean, Mary knew, right? But Jesus' brothers and sisters, they they didn't see Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior. They didn't think he was the God-man. They thought he was a little cuckoo. I mean, really, those are, are your only options. He's going around telling people he's the Son of God, and they're saying, no, we're, we're your siblings, and you're just one of us. They didn't believe in him. James didn't believe. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, 
Paul writes that after that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. So there was a time after Jesus was resurrected from the dead that he appeared to his brother James. And James eventually became a very important figure in the early church. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we find that Mary is there, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. So now you have the disciples of Jesus gathering together, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And as they're there, we find that Mary is there and that James is there and that his other brothers are there. So there now, they they recognize who Christ is, they're believers. Eventually, in Acts chapter 15, James is the spokesman for the elders and the apostles at the Jerusalem Council. So the level of authority that was eventually granted to this this man, James, was incredible. He sits in a room with with 12 apostles and with all the elders of the Church of Jerusalem And he stands up to speak. He is the mouthpiece of all of these people. James was was an incredibly important figure in the early church. He was the, if you would want to say, the lead pastor, it would seem like, at at the church of Jerusalem. Church where it all started. And so he he has a lot of credentials. But he begins by announcing himself as a slave. The miracle of his inclusion in God's family was more amazing to James than the fact of sharing a birth mother with Jesus. By calling himself a servant, James was confronting our culture's obsession with titles. The person who takes out the trash is the waste management and disposal technician. What is that? We find it all over the place. I remember when I was working um, for Family Service Kent, you would have all of these people, and they would be the manager, and then the assistant manager, and the assistant to the manager, and you'd have just all of these crazy titles, because it's important for all of us to feel like, by our title, by our, do- our degree, by the-, the letters beside our name, we are important. What I'm trying to say here is that James finds his value, his worth, in the fact that he has been called to be a slave to Jesus Christ, to be a servant to Jesus You don't need to find your value in other people, in your title, in your job, in your education, in your money. All of those things will fail you. And to be honest with you, there's always someone with a better title. There's always someone better than you. When we find that we get to be the servant to the king of kings and lord of lords, that's something to be proud of. I mean, that's something to to, to talk about. That's something worthwhile. So this is who James, James sees himself to be. And to be honest with you, this is what all believers are called to be, to be slaves to Jesus Christ. James is writing here to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And there's a lot of been written about who this, this, who's talking to about here, the 12 tribes of the dispersion. And he is either writing to Jewish believers scattered outside of the promised land. So there's Jews that have been saved. They're now brothers in Christ. They have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're scattered so they're in difficulty here. Or he's using the word 12 tribes as a metaphor for God's people. So he's either writing to just Jewish believers or he's writing to all believers and the 12 tribes represent all believers. Um, I was talking to somebody earlier this week and I said, I'm studying this and I just, I don't know, like, if I should take a side, if I should give my opinion. Um, And... They said, well, I guess I'll find out when I, when I show up on, on Sunday, and you're not going to find out. Sorry. I, I really, I, I don't think it really matters, to be honest with you. Um, I think that based on the content of this letter and the fact that the Holy Spirit inspired it and put it in Holy Scripture and preserved it for us today, it means there's something in here relevant for us. Also, when we look at the book of James, what you find is that so much of what James said is has already been said by Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. That Jesus' version of Christian living is the exact same as James' here. If that's true, and what Jesus expects of his disciples, of Christians, is to live like this, and now James says the same thing, it's for us, right? So it doesn't matter what James, who James is referring to here, this book is for us. It will be helpful for us in our Christian life. James immediately in verse 2 gets right down to business. He immediately confronts our worldly perspective on suffering. 
Verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. He begins here with the reality of suffering and difficulty. He doesn't sugarcoat the situation. He doesn't try and provide a quick fix. He shows, rather, that there is a method to the madness when you fall into diverse temptations, meaning it's not if, it's not maybe you will, it's when. Meaning it happens to everyone. It happens all the time. The truth is, suffering trials, they are normal, they are usual, they're par for the course. If you're a human being, you will experience them. Jesus said, you will have troubles in this life. You don't need to look for them, they will find you. What kind of difficulty will find us? What kind of temptations is he talking about here? Well, he says, it's diverse, it means assorted, or or a large variety, all shapes and sizes. The things that we come against in our lives are are varied persecutions, varied difficulties. What you're going through is going to be different than what you're going through. All of us could share our stories, and we'd all say, this is is my trouble. And it's, it's incredible when you look through the body of Christ to know what other people in this church have suffered. The stories that we could tell about our lives and what we've gone through. And there are even some people, when you look at their lives, and you're like, man, they look like they're not suffering at all. It looks like their life is easy. Truth is, they've suffered. There might be so many battles that they're facing inside of them that you don't know about. So people, believers, we suffer. We suffer various kinds of trials. The temptations here, I mean, trials, testings, difficulties, persecutions. Sometimes it's even our own lust. It's our our own desire to sin that's a trial for us. Temptation is the negative reality of a life in a fallen world. If I was in a conversation with anyone, and I said, don't you find that trials just bring you immense joy? What would you think of me? If I said, don't you love it when life beats the tar out of you? When, when you feel like you were just punched in the gut? Isn't that just so pleasurable? you think I was nuts, right? you think I was crazy. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. James, you're crazy. This doesn't make any sense. No one would listen to what he's saying in this culture, in our life, with our natural state. Nobody would hear that and say, yeah, I love trials. I love it when life is terrible and painful and sad and I'm going through suffering and difficulty and I don't see why this is happening. I just, I just love it when I feel like I'm unloved and unwanted. Bring it on. Nobody says that. I love not having money to pay the bills. Man, losing your job is so much fun. It's not how we think. It's not true. It doesn't seem right. So, So here's the paradox of the Christian life. How are we to find joy when we fall into a variety of temptations, of difficulties? Why should we deem an otherwise negative experience as a cause for joy? Practically, when you go to the doctor and you hear bad news, why is there a reason to rejoice in that? When you're treated badly by someone you love, how is there a cause for joy? When you're persecuted, mocked, slandered, how is that a good thing? He gives us the answer in verse 3 and 4. He says, verse 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. How do we find any kind of joy in trials? It's not by feeling something different. It's not by attempting to change the way we feel about it. And so if you go into a trial and you say, I'm just going to put a smile on my face no matter what happens, you know what's going to happen? Your smile's going to look really foolish. It won't make any sense. It won't match how you're feeling. We can't manufacture feelings inside of us, and we're not told to do that. What we're told is there's something that you can know, some knowledge that you can have, some truth that you can cling to, that the trying of your faith is not just for the sake of pain. It's not just to hurt you. The trying of your faith works something out in you. It produces something in you, and and namely here, it produces 
Patience. What kind of patience is James referring to? When I, when I saw this, when I, reading it, I mean, you hear patience, and you think, patience is a virtue, and I would certainly like to get angry less often, and I'd like to be more patient while I'm in line at Tim Hortons or whatever, but patience isn't worth immense suffering when we think of patience. But the word here for patience, it's not just referring to, do you have this really quick temper? Are you able to just be patient when children are being super annoying over and over and over and over and over and over again? Right? It's not just what it's talking about. Patience here is perseverance. It's steadfastness. It's endurance. Staying power. Heroic fortitude. It's toughness. The trying of your faith it makes you tough. It makes it so that you can endure. It makes it so that you can stay faithful in the trial. It makes it so you can get by. That you don't lose your faith, that you don't quit, that you don't call it, call it a day. The trying your faith actually produces something that is incredibly important for us because we are all going to face trials. And if we can face trials and, and stay the course and remain faithful to God and trust him through it, then there is a kind of joy. And so to know that when trials come in our life, God has a purpose for that. That there's a reason behind it. I wish I was someone who would get up early in the morning and just go to the gym. Justin in the room? Justin gets up every day at like 5 a.m. and he goes to the gym for a few hours. And then all day long, he eats super well to help his muscles grow and and. And I wish I was more like that. I wish I, was, I had that discipline. Here's the truth that I found. My muscles don't grow if I don't exercise them. Parts of me grow if I don't exercise, but it's not my muscles. And that is evident when you look at me and when you look at Justin. See, we all want to have strength. We want to have endurance. We want to have steadfastness. You will never, ever have that without trials. It's impossible. That cannot be produced in your life without going through difficulty, without going through trials. This is an incredibly important virtue for the believer, incredibly important. But it cannot happen outside of suffering. That is God, that's the only way. And so, yes, pain is hard for a time, but it produces something wonderful. There is... um, a Newsboys song that I think has been mentioned in our church before. Um, How do you know if you have genuine faith? Do you know that your faith is genuine when life is good and rosy? When you're happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise? I don't think so. I think you don't know much about your faith at that point. Um, Newsboys wrote the song, Wherever we go, the bluebirds sing and the flowers bloom and the grass gets green. Where... The bees behave, the treetop squirrels smile and wave. And it presents this picture as though like Christians are going through life and everything is, is rosy and wonderful. Uh, that's a bad song. Because it's not true. It's funny and clever and catchy maybe. But it's just not true. Christians don't go through life experiencing treetop squirrels smiling and waving. It, it, and, and nothing like that. It's not like everything automatically gets better because you're a Christian. That is a silly song. You know when you feel overwhelmed? When you're way past the end of your rope? When you're barely able to lift up your head? But you still do. And you utter the words, Father, help me. That's when you know you have faith. When you're going through the fire and you're holding on to God, that's when you know you have faith. And that's when your faith grows. That's when it becomes something wonderful and and glorious. We all love the mountaintop experiences, but we all also know that nothing grows on the top of the mountain. All of the sustenance is in the valley. And the only reason anything grows in the valley is because it pours rain there. Wouldn't it be wonderful if just every day was perfect and, and sunny and nice? Well, it would be for a little while until there's no rain and nothing grows and everything's destroy. We are uh, at our house, we're planting a vegetable garden. We do this every year, and every year it 
kind of turns out. Um, last year, it wasn't our fault. We're going to go with that. Um, <laughs> I think the soil has some kind of disease in it and something. But anyways, the, the, this year, we're doing a garden again. But in order to get the seeds to grow, first we have to separate them from the warmth and comfort of their package. We have to remove them from all of their friends and stick them in a dirty soil and then pour water on them. And then hope that the sun comes out and the sun just beats at them all day long because they never grow without that. Right? They don't, they don't grow in the package. And sometimes we're insulated in our little package in our life and we think, this is great. I have such great faith. God, I'll worship you right now. Yeah, great. You have no idea what kind of faith you have because you haven't been taken out of the package. Because you're not going through it. And the only way you ever grow is when you do. God has a plan in your pain. Verse 4 says, But let patience, let endurance, steadfastness have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire Wanting nothing. Okay, so why is it so important that we get to the point that we can endure? That we can be steadfast through our suffering? Because if you don't get to that point, then you will never mature. Then you're stuck. Then every time a trial comes, it sets you back to, I don't know, God. I don't know if you exist. I don't know what's going on. Like, you can't keep moving forward in your Christian life unless there's suffering. And as soon as you suffer and you suffer poorly, you don't trust then you're set back. It's not helpful. But when we do suffer and we suffer well and we trust God through it, then patience will have a perfect work. It will make us perfect, complete, and entire, wanting nothing. I I can't imagine James picturing a more perfect version of a believer, that they're perfect, that they're entire, that they lack for absolutely nothing. What, What pain does is it adds virtue upon virtue upon virtue until it can be said of you that you are lacking nothing, that you are like Christ. And when you see people in our church, when, you, when you've encountered believers and, and looked at them and said, what compassion they have, what grace they have toward people, how merciful they are. When you see the fruits of the Spirit evident in, in a believer's life, do you know what you know for certain? That they've endured suffering. It's the only way that that's ever happened. That's the only way that that is produced in that person. I think we all understand the necessity of this. I think we all get it. Yet we live our lives trying to insulate ourselves from all pain. Don't we? When's the last time you walk toward pain with your head held high? We do everything we can to avoid it. A lot of times what it means is we won't sacrifice anything of ourselves because we're protecting ourselves from that pain. We won't put ourselves out there for that relationship. We won't love that person because we might be let down. We won't give of our, our own money, our own finances, our, our, our time because we might not have enough for ourselves. We're just in this protection mode and we don't need to be. We have a God who if he brings those trials, he has a wonderful purpose and plan for them. When I looked at this text, there was a couple lessons that I think just jumped right out at me. So I want to share those with you really briefly before we conclude. Um, The first thing I think that that these verses are trying to do, certainly everything that's being done here is counter-cultural. It's it's counter-intuitive. It's it's just different from what we expect. But the first thing, I think he's trying to change our perspective and our identity. Who are you? What makes you valuable? What are you here for? James is clear that your identity, the reason you are on the face of this planet, is because you've been called to be a servant of Christ. If you are called, jump at that opportunity. There's nothing better. I mean, it would be better for you to be a servant, a slave of Christ, than to be his natural-born brother. Isn't, Isn't that what's clear here in the way that James introduced himself? There is an amazing story in Mark chapter 3, verse 31 to 35. And we find that Jesus is teaching. And while he's teaching, there are, the multitude sees that his mother and his brothers and sisters are trying to get a hold of him. And so the multitude, being very kind, says, hey, Jesus, hold on for a second. Your brother and your, your siblings, they want to talk to you. So just stop your teaching for a second. 
because they're going to talk to you. Talk to you. And, and in verse 33, Jesus says, he answered and said, Who is my mother or my brethren? Well, that seems obvious. They're standing right there. That, that's them. And he looked round on them that sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and brethren. He looks at his disciples and those sitting at his feet to learn. And he says, These are my brothers and sisters. This is my mother. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. And at one point, James thought, man, Jesus is rude because he's not considering me his brother. And now he sees how much better it is to be the person who is doing the will of God and considers himself a slave to Christ. Because what's amazing is, when you consider yourself a slave to Christ, you know what that means? It means that you're a forgiven sinner. It means that you've trusted Christ. It means that he's died to pay your sin debt. It means that now you're a saint. It means that you receive the grace of God. It is much better to be a slave of Christ than, than to be a slave of this world, to be a slave to your own sin. And so often we're, we're calling what we have freedom, and we're just enslaved to our own lusts, our own desires. And now he can say, I'm a slave to the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. So I want to ask you a question. Are you more like James from Mark chapter 3 or James from this letter? Are you thinking more naturally about Jesus? He's my brother. Or are you thinking about Jesus as he's the king? He's my savior. He's my Lord. We are privileged to serve the only one who is worthy. We are privileged to give our life for him. Before our silly job titles, before our money, before our looks, before whatever it is that we think is important, and whatever it is that the world is telling us is important, we get to be servants of God. It is a privilege. And so let's see ourselves this way. Let's change our perspective. See, this is what James is trying to do. This is, this is an eternal perspective. An eternal perspective is that serving the king of kings as a slave is better than just being a natural brother. And so let's have that perspective. The second thing I think he's doing is he's changing our perspective on difficult circumstances. It's not if we face trials, it's when we face trials. So when we face trials, how do we view them? The trial itself, it's not fun. The trial itself is not joy, and and James doesn't say it is. He says to count it as joy, deem it as joy. In other words, your perspective on the pain that you will still go through can be changed in a way that will allow you to see this as joyful. Um, Peter says almost the same thing. He says, wherein we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, we are in heaviness through manifold temptations. 1 Peter 1.6, verse 7, he says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found in praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ. Trials aren't bad for the believer. Chapter 4, verse 13, Peter says, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Rejoice when you suffer with Christ. Verse 16 says, glorify God for your sufferings as a Christian. But it's not even just Peter. It, 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 like We look at what Paul wrote, and he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tri- tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So we can glory in our difficulties because we know God is working something great through them. There are many examples of this in Scripture. I'll give you a, a couple In Acts chapter 4 and 5, we find the apostles being persecuted, being beaten, being tortured, being um, warned by the Sanhedrin, the the highest Jewish rulers, not to preach or teach Jesus' name ever again. And after they go through all of that torture and that agony and that suffering, it says they rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Their their perspective was eternal. They were given the opportunity to 
to suffer for the name of Christ, to serve him in this way, to partake in his sufferings. That's a joyful thing. Um, We find Paul and Silas in Philippi, tortured, chained, arms and legs chained to a a wall in a cold, dark cell. (laughs) And they're singing praises to God. They rejoiced in their sufferings. I think we can do a message like this and give the impression that, at least I think, that the sufferings that we're going through, that you're going through, are easy, and that that doing this is just, oh yeah, obey the Bible. Um, you think that's bad? You should just rejoice in it. It's, I hope you recognize I'm not I'm not doing that. I, I'm not trying to diminish, demean your suffering. I know that people suffer here in incredible ways. Many of whom I, I don't even know what you're going through. So I'm not trying to say your suffering isn't real, that it doesn't hurt. What I'm saying here is that we have a Father, a perfect and good heavenly father and he's not putting that in your life because he doesn't like you because he's trying to hurt you in fact it is the opposite that trial is there in your life because of how much he loves you and because he loves you so much that he wants to see you learn to endure he wants you to become more and more perfect more and more like his son it's worth it it's valuable trust our father through the trial Believe that he knows what what he is doing even when you don't. There's a poem called Footprints, and I think everybody knows this poem. And the poem goes that there's two, um, two sets of footprints in the sand as I was walking through life, but then I look back at my life and I saw that when trials came, there was only one. And every time I start welling up, because I know oh, that means God was carrying him. That's so sweet, right? I don't know if that happens to you. Maybe it doesn't happen to you. Um, I hide it really well. So, so I read that poem, and it, it really, it's like, you know, oh, yeah, that's time God was with me. But the problem is, that's great to think about in somebody else's life, and maybe even great to look back at, on our lives and say, oh, yeah, I see how, how God was with me there. But that doesn't help us today, because we don't feel like we're being carried. We really don't. We feel like we're walking all by ourselves. And what James is saying here, truth of God's word, there's something that you need to know even, you know, even though you might not feel it. And you must let truth transform how you're looking at this. You must allow truth to change your perspective on your suffering. Spurgeon said this. He said, I am afraid that all the grace that I have got of my comfortable and easy times and happy hours might almost lie on a penny. All of the grace that I have received from the comfort and the happy times, that it all might lie on a penny, that it is incredibly small. But the good that I have received from sorrows and pains and griefs is altogether incalculable. Affliction is the best bit of furniture in my house. It is the best book in a minister's library. It wasn't just true for Spurgeon. The grace and the the lessons that we learn through our pains and our griefs and our sorrows, they are incalculable. and They can't be found anywhere else. I I believe the goal of James today and and my goal today, it's not to, to convict you or to make you feel like you haven't gone through your trials well. The goal today is to encourage you. To encourage you that whatever you're facing right now, that God is there that he has a plan for it. That if you will trust him and see your trial through his eyes, there is a way of rejoicing in that trial. There is a way of finding joy in knowing that that your father is working on you, that he's producing in you something glorious for, for your good, for his glory. So I hope that as we look at James here and we read what seems to be a crazy statement, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. It doesn't make any sense. But from an eternal perspective, it really does. It makes sense that if God is doing an eternal work in you, it's good, then the pain you're going through now, no matter how great it is, it's worth it. And so let's trust our Father through trials.